this closer to a really good site, and I'm really happy with this little location. Well, I'm glad to be back here very again. Very important and program, uh, and in the audience, welcome very much to Conversations. We have as a guest today Robert Pollard, and I'm just complimenting on him on my having gone over the enormous amount of really interesting work in the area of information ecology that he has gathered and has put upon various websites and so forth. And we're going to have reference to a particular article, I think, among others, by Mr. Chris Anderson, who had written a piece. He's the editor of uh, Wired magazine talking about information. He says, tech is too cheap to meter. It's time to manage for abundance, not scarcity, an article that appeared. And um, there's a lot of talk about that and other matters, but Robert, so good to see you. Welcome very much to Conversation MMM. Good to be back here. Okay, really good to talk with you. Um, I, I would ask you just briefly, like in the very short kind of way, your background a little bit, you're just born and raised a little bit, and then I want to get to a discussion of what is information ecology, and then we'll get into some of the discussions of where we stand in terms of cybernetic and information developments on this planet. But could you share just a little yeah. of your background? I, I grew up in England in a suburb of London, south of London, and uh, I was a twin. I was born at home on, my, on a place called Pilgrim's Way. And no I think kidding. that sort of seems like a fitting place yeah, because right, my, right, in right. many ways my life Identical twin has been fraternal? no uh, fraternal and okay. younger than I. Okay. And um, I, I was the, we were quite different, and I was the kind of academically successful one. I got a scholarship to the local public school, which is a private school. Yeah, I know. That's and a then, confusing, but yeah. And then from there, a scholarship in mathematics at Cambridge. Good for you. And, uh, and moved into sociology. Mm -hmm. Well, I moved into economics in, in my, for part two of my, uh, what they call the tripos there, uh -huh. which was the econo Cambridge economics department was, you know, strong influence of Keynes and all sorts of Marxist economists, okay, very uh, and um, and ended up uh, being in, becoming interested in sociology, being frustrated with the limitations of economics in dealing with external costs. Thank you, externalities. Externalities, yeah. Uh -huh. And then I got a came to the states. I came to Boston in. Uh, 66. You, you took a master's at Cambridge, or a bachelor's at Cambridge? Bachelor's at, at Cambridge in okay. math and economics. Okay, and then, good, yeah. and, and then, then my uh, research assistantship in Boston on the uh, quantitative analysis of the oh, French re Revolution. Wow, okay. And that was my introduction yes. to computers. Yes, right. I mean, this was very different. That was IBM cards and uh, a very primitive level, but it gave me a tremendous insight mm -hmm. into the kind of how one can organize and present and uh, yeah. uh, information in ways that allows you to see see a lot deeper ways of what's involved. Is there a term linear regression? There is a term linear yeah, regression. Yeah, and also quantitative uh, analysis. That's really interesting because, and it was all, it was, and that was just coming. The cyber was coming and then you it picked was, up It was an, a, right, an early project funded by the National Science Foundation. You didn't carry and out of your training in economics a, an adherence, if that's wrong, or maybe less than an adherence in any strong, absolute sense, to economic theory or who among those of the canon might be able to best address, let's just say, for instance, the current financial problem as we confront, you didn't get into Chum Peter or? I got into a lot of different. Fre Friedman? Uh, no, Friedman, the Friedman School was not strong at Cambridge. It has been uh, more recently. Yeah, but n Cambridge was, was much more, uh, you know, it was a department of political economy right, rather yeah. than economics, yeah. and it was uh, strong, I say, with Keynesian mm -hmm. approach and a number of leading Marxist scholars were there. Okay. Too. So that was a that was a big influence. So you didn't you but didn't I did. I mean, I, I would you count yourself? Do you remember, if I may, Mr. Nixon said we're all Keynesians now in 1972? And I wonder, do you have any notion of what we all are now as you grapple with the economic situation on the world scale? We don't. I don't, I don't think there is. I don't think there is a consensus. I think okay. that what is emerging mm -hmm. is a radical new economics yeah. that's. It's based on the same fundamental laws of economics, but the conditions, the fundamental law, uh, the, f the fundamental law in a way of, of economics is the supply and demand yes, indeed, curve. Right. And that gets thrown into uh, another that. dimension yes. when, because the, the essence, the essential premise of that is that mm -hmm. in an equilibrium situation, the price will 
approximately be the marginal cost of producing another item, another widget, another right. uh, loaf of bread, bread another story, yeah. whatever. Uh -huh. And what happens in an information environment mm -hmm. is that marginal cost is effectively zero. Isn't that something? That's what Mr. And what's, uh, right. Yeah, right. he's talking about. And then you be, that puts you into the world of cybernetics. It gets you into a, a, into a very different situation, which really explains why mm -hmm. things like open source yeah. Uh, it's one of the aspects of why open source is a natural equilibrium mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't cost anything. Not only is it the cost factor that's, mm -hmm. that becomes essentially zero, mm -hmm. but the dynamics, mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, if there's something you don't like about Microsoft Word, what are you going to do about it? Yes, Nothing. Right. Uh -huh. But if there's something you don't like about, say, I use this software Tiddly Wiki. It's a okay. wonderful, wonderful software. Okay, if I want to do something that can't be done, mm -hmm. maybe I don't know how to do it, but I'll write a, a, an email message to the support the group, group yeah. Yeah. and I'll get an answer back within an hour or two. Oh, wow. okay. And someone has either already fixed it right. or finds a f comes up with a solution. Yeah. Yeah. And that benefits yeah. me. Absolutely. It benefits me, but it benefits everybody else. That's right. It's like and even, yeah. even if I'm not able to provide the answer, right. just by asking the question, yeah. it evokes an answer. Mind. So it's a self-organizing system and okay. a self-correcting system. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with one of the leading developers in the TiddlyWiki community. And, okay. and I had mentioned a little problem I had with one of his little plugins yeah. and little features. And he said, ah, yes, I know how that is. We were sitting up on Columbus, uh, a <laughs> coffee shop in Columbus, Amsterdam. He had a little computer there. He fixed it in about five minutes, <laughs> uploaded it, uh, and it was fixed. Isn't that you wonderful? Know, and isn't it was fixed wonderful? for me and fixed for everybody else. I know. So you and I had a little and, talk uh, on the telephone. Is if, you, if I have a bushel of wheat and I get the bushel of wheat to you for your people, that means I have one less bushel of wheat. But if I get a, pro, uh, a, a piece of information that I share with you, I still have the information, you have the information, and all the people that are being linked in have the information. It's non-zero sum almost at the level of immediate observation. Right. Which and that's is different than out of the history. So, I mean, and the, the, fundamental, the fundamental underlying aspect mm -hmm. of why this marginal cost is zero mm -hmm. has to do with essentially the, the fact that information has no mass has no physical size right. and so it is not constrained the reason that if you give me a bushel of wheat you don't have it yeah. is basically laws of conservation of mass of what conservation of mass okay right okay, right yeah, yeah. and and of energy, yeah, and of energy uh, yeah. but that's not you're exempt from those constraints under the new cyber uh, under reality. a situation where the commodity where the goods that are mm -hmm. being produced have no mass and yeah. have no physical like science. Like information. Like information, exactly. Ecology. Yeah. There should be yes. somebody working and, out in ecology. And, 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 um, mm -hmm. and th again, part of it, too, is that it is really a transformative environment. In a qualitative which, sense. In a qualitative sense. It is actually, the way I see it and with how I see information ecology, it is actually another universe uh, that universe. is a realm, a realm of nature, a realm of the natural world. That hasn't previously been visible, hasn't but been available to hasn't you. been accessible, right? Right. Okay. Possibly to certain mystics and whatever uh -huh. in certain ways, uh -huh. but uh, that you are able to access and discover the nature, and we are actually living. Though anyone who uses a computer mm -hmm. is essentially living and working in this other universe. Mm -hmm. Other universe is a large term. It's a uh, universe, yeah. It's uh, and it's a vast. Paradigm that no, it's not of, just. Not it's a not a material. We think of a the universe. Of we think of the, most people when they think of the universe think of the material universe, uh -huh. the physical oh, universe, okay, the yeah. the, so, the earth, the solar system, yeah, the right. galaxies, yeah, right. uh, etc. Mm -hmm. But this is not. This is independent of that. It's not. It's, and it's infinitely vast, essentially, in principle. Infin infinitely in large, vast. large, yeah. And it's also not limited to mm -hmm. three dimensions or four dimensions, if you include time. Uh -huh. There's no limit to the number of dimensions of that space. And this new universe has been attended upon the discovery of uh, things cyber or digital? It's essentially, yeah. I mean, the, being, 
the ability to develop and uh, process things in this information environment with discovering how to create and how to live, but also discovering the nature and properties of that universe. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one of the things, it's, it's not constrained by material constraints, nor is it essentially constrained by time nor place. Uh, so okay. I can a large concept. The yeah. large concept. Yeah, it's, right. a, it's uh -huh. a very different what you, one needs to let go. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the reasons why young people find it easier because they're not so attached to how they've sort of learned that the world is. Those kids, I see seven-year-olds playing in a computer like Vladimir but Horowitz plays the piano and it's yeah. just instinctive. It's, it's, it's so natural. encouraging. You understand so it, but one can, be, one can be in many places at the same time. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. You know, both in terms of in a browser, I can have maybe 40 different tabs open, mm -hmm. and I can move to, without virtually no effort and no time and energy expended, I can move between different spaces effortlessly. When was the universe born? And uh, you went back to how you picked up quantitative analysis and doing that early on after you got here to the states. It was a different proposition with the old computers, say, 20 years ago than it is now, and the tendency is very encouraging in terms of cyber developments and what's coming out of the labs and the advancement of the information environment, don't you, don't you think? Oh, right? oh, it is. I mean, it's, when it's, was it it's, a, phenomenal, it's a phenomenal to? process of evolution. Okay. In fact, one of the things that I've been uh, moving towards looking at mm -hmm beyond information ecology, taking it a little step further and a little more explicit of looking at it as information biology and understanding information right. systems as biological entities, as living forms mm -hmm. which are manifesting phenomenal forms of evolution, mm -hmm. very, very rapid forms of evolution. Mm -hmm. If I go back yeah. to 1982 when I used my first, had my first PC, and I look at the software that I had then yeah. and the documents that I had then. Yeah. They were very primitive you still devices. Have them? You still I have, them? have a lot of those, yeah. I still have a lot of yeah, those right. things. And and most of them I actually yeah, even got, brought them with me. Brought them with me, right. There it is. I brought them with me. Oh sorry. Right there, and he's, uh, yeah, and this is professorial manner as other things falling out of This has pockets. space for about four hundred gigabytes. No kidding. Four hundred gigabytes. Four hundred gigabytes. It's about half full. Holy Toledo, um, what is that? That's the thing and you this, plug into this, this I went to Best Buy and bought it for just a little over $100. And the price is going down. And that was a few months ago, yeah, so, so it's probably it less than, you could maybe get a terabyte mm -hmm. for this, for not much more than this. Yeah, right, right. Uh, right. So, by comparison, my first hard drive, which I bought in 82, I think it was, was back. 10 megabytes. Right. <laughs> That's 40,000 times. Yeah. Now, you couldn't fit 40,000 of those disks into this room. And, then before and, that, and it cost me eight hundred dollars. Right, you are, and it was all so. In the early ones, I don't know who it was. It was Norbert Wieners. Uh, mm. uh, I, I, I think I've said this on other program, but he was in the room. He, uh, Mark Stallman's dad, who was a friend mm -hmm. of mine, a banker and so forth, but he was a scholar. His dad was in the room with uh, Norbert Wiener about nineteen forty-eight when they coined the term cyber, mm -hmm. and he used to talk about information overload within a pa within a system permits pattern recognition at another level. And human consciousness, as it's evolved over the long haul, is really very, very good at recognizing patterns, as we do. And so that that's a great uh, hope as we get into a thing of information overload. But the tendency, and the, the, so the year then, when would be the, you say it's a new universe. You're talking try to avoid paradigm in terms of- I'm not saying it's a new universe. That universe has always existed. The it hadn't been discovered before. Okay, we didn't create this universe. Okay. It's always existed, I see. but we didn't know how to access it. Okay. It's not like a speciation in uh, evolutionary terms. You use biological uh, metaphors. Within that universe, mm -hmm. through human interaction mm -hmm. in that universe, through human exploration, discovery, and development in mm -hmm. that universe, mm -hmm. a whole process of evolution has been set in place. Uh, by the, there was a guy, Barlow? Somebody Barlow, who mm -hmm. talked about that, and Stuart Brand was it, somebody who got interested in those kind of implications. Right. Ray Kurzweil, and if you like Ray. Yes, Kurzweil. Uh, Ray Kurzweil. Yeah. Right. Uh, he. I mean, I'm not sure. He he certainly talks about this fundamental shift in consciousness of 
singularity he describes yeah, singularity it. Yeah, uh, where, where the machines reach a level of intelligence that becomes independent of, of humans also, and, and transcends, and okay. transcends yeah. in many different ways. And in many ways we do have that, mm -hmm. that the intelligence that we have access to, mm -hmm. our ability to, to use intelligence is, is tremendously enhanced mm -hmm. by this technology and we can, we can collaborate, the, again, this co-intelligence there's a term that's quite often used. The co-evolutionary journal, too, uh, right. Stuart Brand brought out but, after the whole Earth. But catalog, the, the right? co-intelligence is, is yeah. really, you know, it's based on this community process of feedback, mm -hmm. similar to what I was saying before, mm -hmm. where ideas that I might be able to formulate an idea with a certain amount of clarity, mm -hmm. and someone else may have a related idea, and by sharing and collaborating, and also, again, the very fundamental part of this the, uh, the process of transition to this universe mm -hmm. is letting go of a sense of ownership mm -hmm. and a possession of, so that that the to sort of it's not about differentiating mine and sort of having my idea, but looking at the the greater wisdom that can be gained from from collaboration and saying, well, what if here's someone saying this or has this software that does this, and here's one that ha does this. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to combine these and, you know, bring in these different features? Yeah. That just, just there's a and all these little gadgets, widgets, plugins, mm -hmm. APIs. Those are these key little things that are essentially intelligent devices. That if you feed in a little information, give it a little information, it will collect and gather or, and organize information and present it to you essentially in any format that you want it. Yeah, it's amazing. And amazing. that gives you the ability to see things. I mean, that one of yeah. the examples... Patterns is what I seem to me. Well, if it you is get a larger picture, we may get to a point where we've got a guy. I don't know if you like guy or not, they love oh, yeah. lock, but you get a picture of the whole thing because right. in a certain sense, at a certain philosophical level, everything is connected to everything yeah. else. Yeah, well... And um, it is, he sees it like an organism, the yeah. Earth. Well, I, I'm i very much attuned with that, yeah. and I think it was around 99 or 2000 or whatever where I loosely formulated the Gaia mind hypothesis, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. saying that what is embodied, what is emerging from mm -hmm. the Internet mm -hmm. is, uh, is this Gaia mind that is a functioning thing, and that central nerve, becoming the central nervous system, becoming a brain, becoming a mind yeah. is part of this process of transformation. Yeah, right. That moving towards doing things in different ways and being able to look at the whole. That, one that, that's of the things that's, yeah. that's very fundamental, when, you know, and mm. again, sort of uh, looking back at sort of how, how you're able to see things differently. Um, I took the, if you looked at the climate change report in 90, was it two years ago, mm -hmm. 2007, November, I think, mm -hmm. the, the IPCC report. It, the summary report is like a 30-page PDF document, mm -hmm. and it's essentially geared towards being read as print. Right. We're however, a print era, however yeah. that very much limits the way you can see it yeah, because it makes it a linear process, and it doesn't allow you, it doesn't easily allow you to see the relationships between the different parts. Well, that's back again to the idea of pattern recognition, well, it's and part, that can be done. It's we partly do. pattern recognition, it's partly also seeing, it's sort of deconstructing mm -hmm. that document and restructuring it mm -hmm. to be able to see that it's composed not as, it's not really a single document, right. it's many little pieces right, right. that true. are put, strung together yeah, right. in certain ways, mm -hmm. but in the, because, because of the the IPCC, the intergovernmental community, the scientific community, mm -hmm. is still basically looking towards seeing things in a linear print format. I used to visit, I had a chance, I never could get close in a Hamish way, as the Jewish people say, with Marshall McLuhan, mm -hmm. who had a great mind. Mm -hmm. I was inspired by him. Buckminster Fuller was another great comprehensive mm -hmm. thing. But um, he, he used to um, look at, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at uh, things 
from a very, and he said that in his, he was thinking in media, and he would make a lot of what he called mm -hmm. prose, your ideas that, but he was really wired, but he said that the Western civilization, we're talking about Western civilization, was predicated uh, in terms of media upon, uh, because the media changed, and it was on, on the uh, phonetic alphabet, and that the phonetic alphabet created linear thinking because it strung a thing out in linear form, and that that created a uh, basis for all kinds of institutions and ways of thinking and so forth that is part of the Western model, and that the electronic environment that was coming, it took a long time to come, all through the evolutionary process and everything, was of a different nature, and it was more along the lines of this mm. universe. It seems to me mm. where we were going and right. are going right. is along the lines of what you're trying to put right. forth here. Right. It seems and to it's, me. It's a, it's a network structure. It's right. not. It's and, and again, and as I said, it's not limited to. You know, we think of a physical network, you mm. think of a three-dimensional space, but right. it's not limited to three dimensions. Right. It's really, right. so you can look at it from many different angles That's right. and see things differently. Yeah, including um, notions of human nature, all kinds of basic pre assumptions. Yeah. And then back to uh, Kurzweil, from it, he's talking about instantiating and there being a connection between the human brain, I don't know about the mind, but the brain, and the technology itself. They already have ocular implants that can make people who can't hear hear by putting a, a right. device and uh, rejiggering, as it were, right. the mental process by which they're able then to hear. It's right. an instantiation right. of the computing it's capability. Essentially, right, what you're able to do is take instantiate. information in whatever format it is right. and translate it essentially into any other format. That's one of the things I think, if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to go far afield here and everything, but Sergey Brin and those people, I saw at, at Google, mm -hmm. I saw where they're, they're going to put a lot of attention to search to improve. I think there's a stance for that. But they also were very interested in devoting a lot of attention to translating, not only a, in a utilitarian kind of way, but even to poetic or philosophical, the languages of the world into each other by mm -hmm. using the incredible uh, capability that it had so that you could speak into a device and English and would come out in Swahili or German or mm -hmm. Spanish, and that would be a huge uh, benefit to humanity, or would it? It would have consequences in terms it of it would have languages, cultural identity, uh, being able to level things out, all kinds of things that the technology have these implications that are really massive in terms of the sociological, political, economic mm -hmm. organization mm -hmm. of the whole world. A society. And it's an interesting, it's a good example of where if that was done with that, something like that, yeah. ideally should be done in an open source yeah, environment so where you, you, you don't have, yeah. if, for example, yeah, Microsoft or, say, yeah. General Electric or whatever, some yeah. big corporation right. were to own this, mm -hmm. and they might then, or suppose a Chinese corporation might develop it, yeah. they might be able to distort those translations and filter out just as the Chinese... Uh, uh, sort of censoring a lot of material, yeah, be right. able to mistranslate stuff. So you have to, you, you need that open source, that open feedback system mm -hmm. to be able to protect against those systemic errors that may either occur just through uh, that failure to understand, but may also reflect a, a, a bias to mm -hmm. be able to say, okay, let's, uh, you know, we don't want people to see the world. It's what? threatening to, okay. to conventional economic interests, yeah. uh -huh. many of these approaches, whether it's you know the broader transition or a good case, the peer-to-peer -peer yeah. networking uh, environment. Yeah, maybe you could just briefly spell that out, what it means open source as opposed to what's coming out of history. And I would posit against that, or in terms of that, the famous line I use practically every program mm. is uh, James Joyce having Daedalus say, history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken, and that there's progress being made along the evolutionary line. But the open source in relation to what historically it's building or positing against the traditional cyber pattern, wh what's the significance of that for the audience who's viewing and for myself? Basically, you, basically you know, if you look at Microsoft Windows or other Microsoft products or a, a good number of commercial products, basically you see what it does, you can press the buttons, but you can't really find out how it does it. You mean in terms of the code? And everything? In terms of the code. The uh -huh. code, Microsoft doesn't release its code to other people. What's the, uh, so if there's something that... And what is the implications of the difference between that and what you call open source? 
Uh, the, 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 they, because it's proprietary, okay, they, it's proprietary. they don't want anybody else to be able to take it, make some improvements, and then sell it as a com com competitive product. Let me make a point. I'm going to do yeah. a program after this one with you that will air yeah. before yours, but as right. it happens, he's an art uh, critic, critic yeah. and so forth. And if you have, let's say, let me just take an analogy, and you can blow it to smithereens because I know it doesn't hold. But you've got a Van Gogh, and he's painting a painting, and the painting has the irises or whatever down there, mm -hmm. and he paints it, and then so then another painter should be able to come in and say, that shouldn't be blue, it should be red, but it's a work of art that the artist vision is, and you don't want to, st or somebody come along and say, it'd be good if we chipped the arm off David that Michelangelo made. If you understand what I'm saying, and that they're going to mess up what is a work of art or something well, that has integrity that maybe they can't understand, and it's a threat uh, to the integrity of the system. Okay. Well, I would say they're not going to mess it up. They're not going to mess up what the this thing that someone else has created. That will well, still that exist. The they will make, and again, a number of the yeah. Creative Commons license, which is a new, f a uh, fairly uh, what again? Creative Commons License. Creative Commons license. Which is this is essentially an alternative to the conventional copyright concept. Okay, that's a big and, thing. Yeah. And in, in essentially, a, and, and all of my work that you know my, that I publish uh, is under a Creative Commons license. And you have published an and enormous uh, amount of work. I've published a fair amount. Know, all yeah. of it's online. Pretty much all of it online. Yes, Very indeed. Thing. In common but that that that, that, way, that yeah. book, that that PDF file that I sent you yeah. of the. Jakob Benkler's book, yeah, The Wealth of Network. This is an excellent example, and this is a very good example of integrity, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. which, which doesn't quite apply in the same way to Chris Anderson's book. Yeah. Uh, Jakob Benkler's book was published by Yale University Press, okay. but he released it under a Creative Commons license. Okay. And essentially, what that non-commercial share alike means anybody can take that, and provided they're not selling it, they yeah. can redistribute it and and they can you know change it around well, they, in, okay, go ahead, they go can ahead. they can make changes now I haven't made any changes Wikipedia to the text well they have a they all the work under and uh, although the Wikipedia is not under a not under a non-commercial license okay so you, you can know. use the you can use the Wikipedia content for commercial purposes and so some of the some things one can't post on Wikipedia if they are protected by a non-commercial license. Well, that idea of intellectual property rights and the institution of private property, mm -hmm. and that which has been intrinsic to the Western development of the economy and so forth, uh, patent rights and these kind of things have been part of the pattern of which the uh, societies had advanced and had done technology and protected the inventor from <laughs> people ripping it off or changing it. Or again, back to the thing, if you're going to change the article, He's carefully put together an article, and somebody's going to say, well, he's wrong on that, so you change it. And there should be some place where the thing is, he did it, uh, uh, the integrity, the intellectual integrity yeah. of what he did is not going right. to be messed up by somebody either. Yes, and, and what, I've done, what, what I've done yeah. with, with, with it is both on his wiki, because he, he made it available on a wiki What's site. What's his name again? Uh, Jochai Benkler. B-E-N-K-L-E-R. Okay. -E He's now at the uh, Berkman Institute for Internet and Society at Harvard. Okay. Um, he, um, I've, it was published, it was a 527-page book, uh -huh. and he published, you know, made available the PDF file for that book. Right. Now, it turns out that that's much smaller. Most people would print something on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. This yeah. is it's a book size which is a bit smaller. Yeah. I've I've taken the whole text mm -hmm. and I've republished it in HTML format, which what gives. Does it, what does that mean? What does it do? Well, what it makes content? it different to move it around. Mm -hmm. I've also reorganized. He, he, if you look through his thing, you'll see he, some of his paragraphs are I very. Did. I looked through it. it was some really of it are very long paragraphs. Uh huh. Yeah. That, and the well, reason it's a writing style, Joyce. It's, it's well, it's a writing style. Yeah. But what I did is take those paragraphs and. For each paragraph, have the opening paragraph, and then or each sentence be essentially a bulleted part or a separate part. So I spread it out uh -huh. to take up much more space. Uh -huh. So in fact, those sentence, those paragraphs uh -huh. could really be written as a page, I see. as a full you could page. Uh, 
it, well, I didn't yeah. change it at yeah, all, but right. it makes it much easier to read. The economics of print. You didn't add any content. I didn't add any content. I oh, just, just reformatted reformat it. it. But it makes it, you know, in the, the reason for printing, you know, the a lot of the printing constraints yeah. and the size of the font and, yeah. the, you know, doing it in that paragraph and style are because... Simple economics. Yeah, right. Whereas I've printed some, I've pub republished some of Rumi's poems, uh -huh. and I've done it where it's basically have one or two words on a line, so you're reading it down. Yes. It's a very different yeah. style. Yeah, right. You couldn't do, you know, if you do that in printed form, mm -hmm. it's going to be very expensive. Yeah, okay, yeah. But if you do it in a digital environment, mm -hmm. it doesn't cost you anything well, more. And it allows a very different experience of reading. Yeah, and it gives a lot of free way. Uh, it's a, yeah. They got a concept at Wiki, I think, is a sandbox or something. I'm not sure if that's yeah. a generic term. But it's a place where you can play around with right, things, and you right. don't have to be constrained always by there's not enough. And this idea that uh, Mr. What's his name again? The the editor. Uh, uh, what's his name? The uh, Anderson. Anderson, yeah. Is saying again back to the title of the ad, tech, and it's moving very quickly now. It's moving very quick, almost exponentially. The incre we're going to be. It seems to me we're going to be swimming in bandwidth. We, we are. It, 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 it is. It's absolutely. The article of this is taking so much attention that tech is too cheap to meter. Right. And that further, it's time to manage for abundance, not scarcity. But scarcity in the material world of the historical experience has always been the reality. And speaking about abundance was just ipso facto absurd because there's no way in which there would ever be non-scarcity as a reality in terms of human affairs. So he's positing a very huge transformation mm -hmm. in the historical, uh, uh, institutional, and personal right. psychology of the human species. Right. And I, I mean, you know, as far as in the digital environment, he, he's absolutely right on track. Okay. Uh, however, in a material, physical, the, and I, he doesn't make the, Chris Anderson doesn't. I looked to see when I saw the title of the book, say, so has he released it in a PDF format like Yokai Benkler? Because uh -huh. he's saying it's free to cheap to me that does he make it available free he doesn't make the book available free but he does allow he has recorded the entire yeah, book he he and you can yeah. and you can download that for free well, okay. and he listen did. to it for free you can't you can't web. read it for yeah, free right. but I you went, can i went to his blog and so forth and he said i used to go and do things for free and now i usually get paid if i go and give a speech so the economics comes in and everything and, and you you and you went back yeah. to where you were talking in the earlier stage of your career and everything you said political economy it used to be called political economy mm -hmm. so every Everything in a certain way is put into an understanding of things from a political content mm -hmm. in terms of the institutions we've inherited out of history. Mm -hmm. no? And yes, and recognizing yeah. that economics is a political process. It is, it's tied it, in. It, it is very much tied in. And, yeah. um, and actually, we could present. I, I used to say something that's just cavalier sounding and everything. There ought to be at a university a, a department of everything. Because, in a certain sense, it's true. Everything is interconnected to something else. We break it up into disciplines. Bucky Fuller, God bless him, used to say we had masters who think, uh, the, the world masters who run the world, whether it was McMahon or whoever in Indian thing was an empire, or whoever's running the world, the Illuminati, whoever's mm -hmm. running the world, uh, they divide, they consciously gave grants to graduate schools, and, and they weren't worried about the dullards. They were worried about the bright ones coming up. And they definitely, uh, they, de they consciously set up graduate schools for PhDs in subject area that with linear regression and quantification, they went off in tremendous detail about every little aspect of reality, which kept them so isolated in a tunnel vision kind of way that they wouldn't be thinking about the whole and become a threat right. to the guys who well, think about the whole right. and run the world. Right, and I, I think I would suggest that rather than see it as a department of everything, yeah. a department of the whole, mm. and yeah. that's somewhat different, and that the, a holistic approach yeah. has been central if you a couple of those things that I had sent you are examples of that yeah. where where I really talk about the necessity of a holistic approach and mm. and it's still not well understood it's still not we well understood and because it, it requires a different way of thinking right and it requires a you know it's a way of thinking that's very much easier to to engage in when you're learning in a digital environment because you're not and we're only living in a digital environment in the last couple of minutes of the evolution of human affairs. It's been a linear environment. It's been a very different, and it's also been at a level, I didn't want to go into that thing, that 
that the, the digital is a continuation of the extension of human consciousness through technology that has been remaking the world ever since mm -hmm. we came on the scene back mm -hmm. a couple hundred thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we may be coming to a new relationship to the cosmos in an evolutionary sense, I'm, collective I'm, humanity. I'm absolutely. I mean, I, I you, see... You feel that. That's I, kind of I, a, no, big, I it's see, a big premise to be living in that moment I, out of 200,000 years. I there's see. A I mean, time of qualitative transformation in terms of our relationship to the universe. Right, and I see. I what's his name? Uh, James Burke, I think it was, mm -hmm. had a great series on uh, PBS. I think oh, it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on the really day the universe changed. Yeah. yeah, and he gave an example. Yeah. Galileo's, you know, the way the universe changed when we see that the Earth revolves around the sun rather than vice versa. Do you realize, Robert, they only let Galileo, the Catholic Church, only let right. him off the hook about 12 yes. years ago yeah. for bringing up that preposterous notion that we're not right. the center of the universe right. because like Hieronymus Bosch displayed in his paintings, it really messed up people's sense of identity. Right. And what I'm saying is that, that we have, most of us have been brought up to think that the material world mm -hmm. determines our existence and mm -hmm. governs our existence. Yes, and I'm saying that actually the material world, that actually material world revolves around a law, uh, the laws of nature and a world of knowledge. Well, okay. Um, I don't quite understand. How would you term, how do we differentiate the world? If you say you want holistic, then we would want to understand, we would want to include uh, things going back to Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. We're part of a system. We're made of stardust. We're all, it's all interconnected. So you go back and take a very large thing. The thing at CERN, they're going to get a picture of the shock wave of the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago within a nanosecond of its occurrence. We got one now of 200,000 years after its occurrence. Now they're going to get it down to a nanosecond. A pretty phenomenal capability to take the measure of things by an evolving consciousness that would have mm -hmm. been impossible to say off right. to epithecy right. or anything further down right. the uh, evolutionary line in terms of consciousness itself uh, evolving. And so if you're taking that kind of a view, comprehend, it might be all right to be, except string theory comes along and says we may have par parallel universes, right. the so uh, mathematics right. of it. Exactly. I mean, it's there's, there's a, a number confusing. of different aspects. But part of it, the bottom line is, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I would actually bring it back to the economics okay. of looking at of it becoming a situation where it's knowledge that is the the currency of wealth. Oh, that okay, that would be that wealth, a different you know. way of assigning value. Right, right, a okay. different way of assigning value. How the do we material put a possessions. On that? And well, there's a number of different ways, but mm -hmm. one of the things mm -hmm. to look at mm -hmm. is the fact that, from what I and I haven't looked at any recent studies of it, but I've read of studies that say that there's really the material wealth is not particularly correlated with happiness. No, I, I There's I always really this assumption. I you know, the, yeah, the I U.S. Know, the, I know. The, you if know, I the Declaration of Independence, yacht, the I'm pursuit gonna, of yeah. happiness, yeah. it has been distorted into a pursuit of material wealth. Yeah. And, and that, that's the, that's the truth. The, think about the happy moments that you have. Yeah. The happiest moments in your life. How much of, how many of them has anything have to anything to do with what you have just bought or where, you know, it has right. to do with an uh, inner experience. We've been so, uh, we've that's, been, yeah. that's the true nature of wealth. And I, I remember there was an interesting um, uh, workshop I went to at uh, Union Theological Seminary. Okay. And some different religions, mm -hmm. representatives of different religions talking about the issue of poverty. Uh -huh. And the Buddhist representative said, you know, like, it's not material poverty doesn't really have any, it's not really. Well, that's one way to see it. Um, that, the, I mean, that in terms of happiness, in terms of, uh -huh. of enlightenment, that it's not, you know, there's no particular, I mean, okay, it may give you, if you live with, in a comfortable environment, that you've got time and energy to, to explore the, you know, the inner workings yeah, be of the mind or whatever. Yeah. You may have more time, but mm. basically, um, at the same time, you, you actually, people in in the modern environment, you know, you ask people in New York mm. if they have any spare time. Not a second. Uh, Thirty seconds. Uh, the, yeah. Whereas yeah. people living in a rural life in a traditional thing, yeah. they've got plenty of time. Time, yeah, right. And, you know that they they may work harder yeah. physically, yeah. but they may have. 
plenty of time to sit and if there's a beautiful sunset just and to enjoy stop what they're yeah, doing yeah. and enjoy yeah. it. I can know? understand that. So, so uh, that I would like to interject because I remember yeah. uh, Alan Greenspan, who was our director, you know, the uh, right. Fed and everything, and he was a Ann Randist, uh, an objectivist way back when, and so very right wing. But I, he he gave a book. It came out. He had a couple years ago, or a year and a half ago, or so, and he made that very point. He said, "Well, one of the things we've noticed is that even with the buildup of huge capability, uh, wealth, and that it doesn't seem to make people any happier." Mm -hmm. It was really he made that point, and he meant it in a way that had surprised him, mm -hmm. because that's been the um, the lodestar yeah. of most of the organizing principles of the political order is that right. it's all by dialectical and materialism and Marxism and, and, and whatever. And this is the, this is what has driven. But also this is I, what has driven the economy. Yeah, but in I want so to be careful if I could, Robert, yeah. to say it's too easy to say that uh, well maybe them poor people are really happy. They used to say that about the slaves. The guys eating their meat and drinking their mint julep and say, yeah, but they're happy. And it was an unjust system and one that did not allow anything for like the full development of everyone. So it could be a way of uh, making your peace with an inordinate, unjust system in terms of involving everyone. I don't think the system well, in place really allows for the full maximization of probably about 60 percent of the world population now. Well, and I, the I just think that I think that I offer a different example okay. rather than the slaveholders' perspective. But look at the example of Gandhi. Who Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi, yeah, yeah. Who wore a simple loincloth? Who was did the sort of menial tasks and cleaning out the toilet and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. That was just basic stuff that most people would say, "Oh, this is beneath me." Whatever. But that 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 sort of you know that re renunciation and recognition that the material wealth is not. Well, okay, the, but let's the not goal. Let, okay, but let's not just say let's keep everybody poor because no, they're happy. I'm not saying, no, I'm saying on no, the no, side of those no, no. who are building up I'm great wealth, yeah. and we d we do not have an economic system that is appropriate to what the future requires. If we're talking unleashing the full capability of everybody and the ecology, and that's one of the right. reasons but we I think don't have a system. But I think in there's place. a difference between saying that and uh, you know, and sort of seeming to be an apologist for. For injustice, injustice and yeah. inequality versus comparison of of, a, True of an, e an economy in which having uh, the new car, having the latest thing, having you know all these expensive new items and whatever is from the advertising uh, is like what this appears to be. The message is: This is what you need to be happy. Yeah. Well, also, and and, and it's all and, and, and your thing. What's that fellow's name? I can't pronounce. Heckler or Beckler, Benkler. Or Benkler, Benkler or something. Yeah. He had one of the things he did, because it's a, among other things, you got a whole lot of bullet points and right. sub things yeah. and links and everything. One of this using networking communication to work around authoritarian control. It seems to me the whole political order of the world is built on authoritarian control and power. And some people have power to require other people to do things. All of our institutions, our inherited institutions, are authoritarian. In a certain sense, they have authoritarian. You have a, an authority figure in the school system. You have an authority figure in the corporate thing with a senior vice president telling the others down the line what to do. On an assembly line, you're teaching people to do what they're told rather than what they might want to do in a free order if they did not have to be concerned with being able to have bread to eat. Well, that's and we had debtor's prison in Dickens times and mm. all kinds of very nasty kind of things in order to coerce those people, and we want to be careful not to. It would be good if everybody could be in a certain sense. It would be this idea <laughs> that he brings up, manage for abundance, not scarcity. Scarcity presumes there's not enough and that you're going to have to produce it, and that it's under that rubric that so many of the unjust systems that stunt right. human development and put them into a behavioral psychology, things where they have to go in order to be able to be doing what they have to do in order that they're not going to be on the street and poor and hungry. Okay, but the, 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 the danger with this thesis and the way that Chris Anderson Again, I haven't listened to the whole of the book, but the examples that he, that he gives in the material world of how things have become so oh. inexpensive, um, they they don't address the they don't address the environmental aspect. They don't address the sustainability of these things. So whether it's uh, you know he talks about corn 
as being, you know, such an incredible thing. It's so cheap and it generates all these things and, you know, everywhere. Don't the try to make ethanol out of it. But, well, <laughs> but that's what they are doing. That's yeah, but that's a, bad, they are that's doing. a bad thing. But, yeah. but even most of the corn is going to feed cows. Mm -hmm. Much of it is going to create corn syrup, and it's again, it's subsidized. And we're talking about the fact that it's subsidized mm -hmm. corn syrup. Terribly We've got subsidized. a situation but where obesity is a bigger health problem th in the U.S. than uh, than lack of food, mm -hmm. um, and the corn, the the ubiquity of corn is having a tremendous, and the, essentially the cheap availability of corn syrup mm -hmm. is. Very deleterious to people's health. Well, and yeah. and it's also very deleterious to the environment. The amount of energy that yeah. it takes mm. to produce corn. Yeah, the amount of energy it takes to produce beef. beef. Yeah, is you could feed so seven much. people feed on so one so that much. it takes to feed. Buckminster Fuller used to have a couple things I'd throw in for a minute. Mm. He used to talk about ephemeralization, and he was uh, he got political sort of with Grunch of Giants and Critical Path and so forth a bit kind of later in his life, but he was essentially a design scientist. And he was, uh, he was saying that uh, you could have a design science revolution, that is that you could have through good design and through a process he called ephemeralization, mm -hmm. that is being able to do more with less. Mm -hmm. So that you do not have to rape the environment as we did with the mines in Cornwall and whatnot, or in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania in order to have it. And one of the leading examples of that, you were referring to the computer industry itself, you had a room to put vacuum tubes the size of this 50 years ago in order to get a little computing power, which is now down onto a microchip, and it's going molecular, mm -hmm. the, the basis of it, so that you can have, without raping the environment, as we've had to do historically, through good design and through, the, through, through, through good uh, uh, design, you could have that. That's one principle. And the other one is on the food thing. He used to say... He used to put on weight once in a while, like we all tend to do. I used to be able to do the full lotus. I can't do it anymore, and I'm very upset with that. I'm going to get on an exercise regime. But anyway, he used to say um, he, would, he would put on weight, and then he would just, all he would do, his diet would be beef and tea. And his thing, his principle was, from a very comprehensive understanding of uh, reality, he said there's prana or chi in the environment. It's concentrated through the uh, vegetative photosynthesis, even further concentrated in the grain, the wheat, the barley, the corn, and so forth. And that that's even further concentrated in the food chain up to uh, beef. And he said in order to get the amount of prana or stored energy that is coming out of the environment, uh, of one pound of beef, you'd have to eat seven pounds of uh, grain, and that it was better to do that. Except well, at I'm an ethical going, level, you could yeah. draw the line at people. And I draw yeah. the line at people. I don't eat and, people. And I don't, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to get into an argument with you on that. I don't okay. say not that an I don't. I know. I, I, I would disagree with with Bucky Fuller over that. I, I, okay. I think he was what, was mistaken in that. Well, it could be. The, yeah. the, you know, the, the it would be mistaken in the uh, in that analysis that yeah. there, would, there would be other ways that he could lose his weight with. Well, that uh, would involve that that exercise and things. And no, yeah. but I know even in diet, if he would eat uh, fresh juice, you know, carrot juice and things like that, uh, that are much easier to absorb. That that it goes very much directly. He could lose his weight a lot quicker with much, much, much less well, impact it may have been a on the I don't think, I think so. It, anyway, but uh, the ephemeralization, it was a but the it was ephemeralization a of doing more but with less and that we can yeah. have, we can have a more, everybody, it, you know, you've got an argument with the global warming where they're going to blame everybody for the fault. I mean, the masters running everything who own all the assets is very narrowly held and so forth. And we don't have an economic system that is apparently, uh, despite all the things that are going on now, in my view, we need something brand new. But um, th th you could say, well, it's all the people's fault for being, they could have gotten by with a 5-watt light bulb rather than a 10-watt light bulb. And it's their fault for being so profligate. Of being so profligate, yeah. and that's the thing again yeah. of well, the wealthy braming. Do you understand again. what I'm saying? That's yeah. an argument. If, 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 if they should be saying, you, if the, you the want. The problem is the, econo the present economic system doesn't support that because the profits 
are in the expensive items, and in and there's a continual marketing push to be able to say bigger, more powerful, brighter, etc. is better. And so yes, you could ignore all of that and block out of all of those advertising messages and well, uh, listen to listen to your body in terms of what you need to eat rather than than. Being well, distracted. This, if you walk with a kid, if you if you, if you if you would walk with a child in a supermarket, yeah. and you look at the way the products are geared to grab the attention of the children, yeah. to say this is something that's exciting, this is new, this is whatever. Oh this yeah. Is, and it's the, the brighter, the the more the packaging, the color the more, matters. The, yeah. the worse it is. Mm -hmm. Almost exclusively, whereas a bag of rice, you know, brown rice. Much much healthier. Okay, I don't. Whatever, but I don't it doesn't have the, it doesn't yeah. have the marketing. It there isn't the profit yeah. margin to be able to make on. Okay, so right, yeah. so yeah. it's yeah. Uh, you know there's a very strong yeah. the 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 whole economic model yeah. is based on promoting more and more consumption and more and more high end consumption. Yeah. Well, rather okay. than mm -hmm. promoting simple living. I mean. Well, yeah. You know, if one of the things that's interesting doesn't take a lot, get a lot of attention in the healthcare debate, mm. but I was I forget where it was that I read this recently, but or I think it was Dr. Emmett, or what's his name on on um, PBS. But one of the single best indicators of someone's health is whether you make home cooked where you cook your own food. It's better to home cook? Yeah, that that's one of the best indicators Better than of the home cook? I, I got know, it. If you prepare, and particularly, you know, if you eat salads and fresh fruit and whatever, it's far, far healthy. Most of the Dr. Health, Ornish. Most know? of the health care uh, problems are hmm. diet-related uh -huh. uh, from eating the junk that... Uh, you know, and that doesn't really get into the healthcare debate very right. much. Right. Oh, and it's a sidebar. But the thing is not a yeah. sidebar is the elegance of design. And they're going to be, we're getting to carbon 60. Nanotechnology is coming. It's going to give us a source of materials a thousand times stronger than steel. And so, so there's all kinds of things. But, and the carbon 60 is coming. It's going to be the basis of all computing. And it's going to be molecular. And it's going to be able to make that line go exponential. So mm. when you get into a situation... Don't let them blame us for our plop, profligate thing because we have a five, we could have had a five watt light bulb and see it if we get up close and in poverty and all that. You should say, if you want a thousand watt light bulb, you can have it. We've got a system where it's going to provide well, plenty. No. You can take your choice well, and not try to blame it on the people for the problems that exist because I'm the system not blaming it on the people, but again, to make that a conscious choice. I mean, one of the models, I didn't say a, a little strategy. thing on that. I've got some a little piece somewhere on the full cost, full cost pricing. Yeah. Uh, market and uh, this could be actually something that could be fairly easily done in fact I just read somebody who's doing something of this nature which is essentially linked to the barcode the ingredients yeah. the contents the environmental impact uh -huh. uh, of you know what's in contained in the material mm. that just people are not conscious and they the information about the the footprint of whether it's the bottled water that's coming from Fiji that being shipped from <laughs> it's Fiji. coming right out of the tap of New York City, or, I think. Well, yeah. not Fiji water. Yeah. I don't think it's, well, but New York but water is great. New York water is great, mm. but again, the, the 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 cost, what that's doing in terms of each time we make a purchase, yeah. what, how is that, you know, a sense of mindfulness? Yeah. What is the impact? What is our footprint? When we walk through our house, yeah. if we've got mud on our shoes, mm. we leave tracks. Yeah. Well, we have that mud on our shoes and much, much more than that uh -huh. whenever we buy something. Uh -huh. And we're tracking it around. I mean, it's not visible to us, uh -huh. but those footprints that we leave. Uh -huh. And I, 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 people talk about one's carbon footprint. Uh -huh. It's not one's footprint. It's yeah. one's footprints. Uh -huh. Everything, yeah. everything carbon. one does yeah. is a footprint. And it's stepping on. It may be essentially stepping on a wildflower, stepping on... Yeah. Uh, well, the Janes, you know, and, the and Janes don't big, want even... And this Jane. is the big thing with the corn, yeah, too, that again, that that, uh, that Chris Anderson doesn't deal with. Mm. You know, it's also stepping, it's it's obliterating. Corn is, is a monocrop culture, yeah. which is the entire 
Mar I mean, the, there's enormous pressure. All the big grain yeah. producers and uh -huh. marketers of seed corn are increasingly genetically modified, yeah. patented things, and a very, na seeds, and a very yeah. narrow, uh, a very narrow uh, biological base that could potentially be subject. You know, that if climatic conditions or some new species of um, a predator comes along, it could be wiped out, and mm. all the so it's undermining the resilience of the the earth as a body mm -hmm. to heal itself, uh -huh, and uh -huh. it's also undermining for those who eat that product. Mm. You know, if you eat a diversity of products and 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 some of the heirloom varieties and mm. whatever, your body is much more able mm. to to respond to the threats, and you don't have to. Okay? If it's not constant advertising on television, there's one other product. Hidden persuaders. No, no. no the other product besides cars is drugs. Drugs and cars. Well, that, if you watch the television, those are the two stand out beyond also anything gambling. else. Also gambling. They're gambling. They not, used to not say gambling not, was not, really not, a bad thing. No, now it's about, become I'm uh, talking the good about thing to do. I'm talking about advertising mm. on television. Yeah. Most obvious thing. It's automobiles and drugs. Yeah. The autumn and the drugs right. are not to cure you, they're to suppress your symptoms so okay. you don't see the symptoms. That's a metaphor. Push those away. We it's only got a minute left, okay, of this okay. whole program. And so what I want to ask, are you optimistic for the human prospect or are you concerned about the fact that on the negative side, the weapon systems that are used to advance the various political orders and competitions and so forth have become species lethal and that we I might... I'm less concerned about by blowing ourselves I, I, up. I'm, I'm less concerned on the threat of, of destroying ourselves with weapons. Much more concerned about the slow process of destroying diversity, of the you know this global warming, which the the most direct and most immediate impact that we're will be being felt. I mean, the Arctic, the temperatures risen. Yeah. Seven or eight degrees could over I, could, the last that, few years, that, that, and that the water supply of the Gangotri Glacier yeah, is yeah. retreating at a rapid so rate, thing and hundreds of millions of people live downstream. So those are the, those are the, you know, it's a chronic illness. Yeah. And it, in at one point, I was wondering, in terms of this whole Gaia hypothesis, whether in fact this self-destructive capacity might be a device for the Earth to save itself from humans. Right. Well, a lot of people think and that we're a plague upon the Earth, and the thing is, one thing is on the global warming, guy has a thing with them. If, if it's true, they've got a thing now where they could surround the thing. Rather than that, they could surround it. Uh, it's in National Geographic and yeah, geoengineering. Uh, no, it, it is. It's technological extension. Yeah. They could put trillions of little reflectors in orbit that's around the Earth and reflect the sun back back that's and what keep it cool. That would be technological is, intervention. Would that be wrong for us to?